So I think, all right, I think we're live. I think this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So hello, everyone. Most of y'all know me. I'm Brooke. This is Nathan, my lovely guest. <laughs> um, so this is a new mini series that I'm doing. We, it's essentially called A Healer's Journey, and it's really bringing on um, service-driven leaders and professionals out in the field who are doing amazing work, and they've also gone through their own healing journey. And so, you know, last week I came on and talked about my journey a little bit, and yeah, just the shifts that I've seen in my life have been um, amazing once, once I started on this journey. And so I really wanted to bring connection and vulnerability to this social media world, especially um, right now. And so I'm super excited to have Nathan on. Um, we met at a training, what, like two weeks ago, Nathan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, I just really enjoyed his energy and I enjoyed our time together. We were like um, doing certain trainings together and it was a beautiful experience. So I was so happy to just work with him. And yeah, so a little bit about Nathan. I know I have it in the description, but what I, what I love about you, Nathan, is that you're, you're an army veteran. Yeah, and you were like mm -hmm. a former deputy, and he also, he has his LCSW, which I have my L, my uh, licensed clinical social worker um, therapist degree part of it, and Nathan is also transitioning into coaching, which is like very, so we have very similar journeys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> around our lives right now, which is pretty amazing, and so just a little bit about you. I'm just kind of reading it off my phone, but you help your clients thrive through generating clarity, confidence, and purpose. And I think that's just so, you know, such important work, especially today. Um, and you enjoy an active lifestyle with mm -hmm. your kiddos and your wife. You have a three-year-old three, three year old daughter and eight, eight month old son, which I was also super excited about because, you know, at the time I was like 27 weeks pregnant and yeah, it was great. So yeah, we'll get started. I'm going to just make sure if anybody has any comments um, or any questions, please feel free to ask those or put them in the comments. I just want to let you know that we do have a 20 second lag, so it might take me a little while to see those. Um, but yeah, so Nathan, do you just want to talk a little bit about you and your journey i'm just gonna kind of let you take over and sure feel into what feels important for you to share yeah absolutely so um thank you brooke it was fantastic i was very lucky and blessed to get paired with you for those couple of days i really really enjoyed it i like that particular training um but again it's such a good platform to meet people like-minded people and i'm happy to be here on social media connecting with them you know i really like as a social worker i really like Brene brown and i think one of the big i think there's three components i can't remember the third one but the one a big one is vulnerability and community for people to really sense have a strong sense of happiness and worth and to feel complete, you know, one is community and another is vulnerability. And it's interesting how vulnerability plays into community and um, that it really disarms people, which really helps them and allows them to connect. And so it's this neat little thing that we get to do and it's fantastic that you're putting together. I'm super appreciative. So here we are. Um, like Brooke mentioned, I, I was in the army, I was in the infantry. And uh, after that, I, I came back to the Midwest and uh, um, hung out for some months and personal trained people and did CrossFit and was thinking about opening the gym and all these different things and um, wound up, never really thought about being a cop, but my sheriff who had known me my whole life offered me a job. So um, I was a deputy for a few years. you were years. a cop too. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so it, it was great. You know, it was my home count or community. Um, the community I grew up in, it's out in the country. I like the country. It was just really nice to give back. And it was a good kind of depressurization process of working alone, working six months out of the year, you know, work a lot of 12 hour shifts. So it was a really great transition for me. But again, I always knew that I'd be 
helping people with mental health. I always knew I'd be a therapist. I just kind of ran away from it in the beginning. I wasn't really ready to go to more school and, and do what I needed to do. So I joined the military. Anyways, um, it's caught for a few years until I decided it was time. I went, I went back to school, started to get my master's and actually got hired on well, with one of the departments of the VA um, midway through my master's. I didn't have my master's yet. I got to be a therapist early. Uh, it was real peculiar. And by the way, even though I've mentioned the VA, what, what I have to share and say has nothing to do with the VA, right? Um, you know, I, I have a private practice, like you mentioned, I'm transitioning and I've transitioned to coaching. Um, but me personally, um, I, I was diagnosed with PTSD and interestingly, even uh, OCD, um, not the acted out type, but the more persistent thoughts type. There's, there's two different versions, actually. I didn't know. Um, but I also had a lot of physical health issues like uh, diverticulitis and a lot of gut, a lot of GI stuff. And so um, physically and mentally, I was just kind of deteriorating and it was not going well. Um, so interestingly, it, it took me some time, like, you know, anything. But primarily i think if i had to sum it up it was really a you know me finding myself and what that means is more of a, a spiritual version for me but also um i i come to find that the hard fact for me was that and what i found and the way i've defined it is that um any issue that i had and i think a lot of people have internal or external is a reflection of an underdeveloped character trait. And so essentially adversity, and even coming back to Brene Brown, you know, she was originally, her research was, I think about love and meaning, how to cultivate that. And she was interviewing people and she talks about how they kept talking about adversity, how that was connected to meaning. And she did not want to hear that. That's not what her aim of her research was to find, but yet that's what she found. And so it's been very interesting, you know, why that is. And it's, be, I think it's in part, at least because if we have these underdeveloped character traits and an adversity comes, it essentially tests or calls up those and engages those underdeveloped character traits. And any type of growth is challenging because it makes, it expands us. It, it stretches our capacity to deal with it. And that's how we grow. That's how muscle grows. That's how we grow in our mind, our body, our emotions, and even spiritually. And so for me, again, it was really facing the music of what are my underdeveloped character traits. And it was tough coming from an infantry mentality and, and being in law enforcement to beginning to look at the negative tendencies and that, it, you know, my, my assertiveness was not being helpful. And it, I don't get to just be assertive by default. I have to really become a whole person. Um, so that kind of spun off into doing a lot of soul searching, literally. Um, and so that, that's basically kind of what I went through. I mean, I'm still going through and will continue to go through, but it was a huge transition and it really changed my entire perspective. And interestingly, my wife, I, we were dating at the time and it's people change in relationships, right? So she has seen me one way <laughs> and she is continuing to grow with me in another. So she is, you know. Uh, a saint, a saintly woman. She is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I agree with so that. My yeah. partner kind of went through, he's seen me one way and mm -hmm. has also seen the transition. And so it's, it's like, oh my gosh, like you're just so amazing that you're still here and like really supportive. Yeah. And yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Learning to roll with it. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And continuing to take t steps forward. Many times I find that people, they, they try to roll with it, but in rolling, they, they stop. Um, you know, it's an art as much of a science. So yeah. it's a challenge. It's good. Yeah. So what, so I just have a few just kind of follow up questions too. Like, sure. um, so transitioning from, so you were like, a vet and then a cop and then transitioned into therapy. That was kind of like mm -hmm. the, the trajectory. Okay. What do you think was, is it, was there like a pivotal moment where it was like, 
okay, I'm ready to like start making these changes. I'm ready to shift from that assertive, you mentioned like the assertive thought process or dynamic. Was there yeah. um, like a pivotal moment in your life where it was like, okay, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to get really uncomfortable and I'm going to start, mm -hmm. like, I'm going to start this, this journey and, and start going within and, and healing myself and, and my world, you know, my world around me. Yeah, there, there was, and it, it was, that moment was preceded by a, a negative moment, you know, a, a growth point. And so what it was, was that I knew, you know, I had creeped and crawled around Afghanistan with the infantry. And even as a, um, I was a infant, I was a platoon leader on the ground front lines, but also a civil affairs officer who manages money and contracts. So you carry backpacks of money around and you, you pay people, the Afghans and you, you sign off on big. And so it's this again, compressed, stressful thing. Um, but the thing is, is that, the first six months of being a deputy, I was working days. No big deal, you know? Uh, but then I switched to nights and it was just too eerily similar to being in Afghanistan. And so I knew you'd come on scene and whether it was meth or domestic abuse or alcohol, I was, I knew, and I knew not even in the back of my mind, I wasn't who I needed to be for those people. And I was trying to authoritatively come over and control like I was an officer on the ground in an infantry situation. And so I knew outright that uh, I had some, some hard work to do, but especially from my heart. And so the thing is, is that um, I realized too that I, I knew I wasn't going to be a cop and I knew that I was going to go into therapy and I got tired of inching my way. I just wanted to do it. I wanted to rip off the bandaid. And so I proposed to my boss, you know, I can switch shifts and, and serve the department in this way because I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back to school full time. And if you want to work with me, great. I'll do whatever I, I got to do, you know. Uh, and they didn't want to switch shifts, so I quit uh, and went back to school. And, and so really it was about choosing my – I knew that I had this truth in me, and I knew that this was going to happen. It was just a matter of speed and pain. And I would rather accelerate the speed, hammer the speed, and deal with it and hang on and create change and move forward then have one foot here and one foot there and it just it just wasn't working and so it was tough you know i i reduced my income by 40 or 50 percent going from officer to deputy and i reduced my income by another 30 percent or 40 percent quitting and going and drawing the gi bill and going to school, but I did get to go to school for free. You know, I'm very blessed. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, I think that's a huge thing for people to know is that, you know, like you were able to do that with, with taking, you know, financial cuts and a part of you knew that you were going to be supported and it, it was going to work out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's a part of the journey, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Sometimes we take cuts, you know, we mm -hmm. take, we take, um, it can be difficult, right? And we can, we can come against walls or barriers. Yeah. And it's exactly what you said of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this and, and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to give up. And I know you've mentioned that before mm -hmm. of just like not giving up, like continuing to go on. Right. Especially if it's your truth, like you mentioned your truth. Mm -hmm. And so there's just one thing I want to ask you because I'm super particular about who I invite on this interview series. Like I really want to invite sure. people who are intuitive and they're connected to their heart. And I feel like that is you. And especially as like a man in, um, you know, a man in this work, I think that's amazing. And so what would you say, do you have any ad advice you, and this, normally I'd get this toward this, you can also add like any other advice you want to give, but towards the end, sure. but do you have any advice for men who are 
like going through their healing journey and like how they can connect in with their heart and maybe what that, what that looked like for you. Sure. So, um, first, the first interesting thing that, um, really taught me a lot, and a lot of that transition, like knowing my truth and following it, a lot of that transition had to do about knowing my worth and believing it too. And so I knew that I had these skills. I knew that I had this value, but I had to, I, though I had it, it, you don't do it. Nothing happens if you don't do it, if you don't do any action. And so I had to forge that I had and forge is the perfect word. I had to forge it and I had to, it was a must, not a want, not a desire. It was a need. I had to do it. And so uh, men and hearts and love, the thing is, is that for me, the, the, the thing that removed the first bit of my damned up love was my wife. You meet my wife, she's got a huge heart. Like if there was one word, it would be love. And, and it's not this over-exaggeration about my wife and all this stuff because she might see this later or something. I literally, very literally, I mean it, you know, she, she is, she is built and geared for love. Um, so she loving me and just watching that, you know, whether it's a, a partner a spouse, a, a, a family member or life or whatever, a dog, I don't know, um, watching that person or thing love you, they're setting the example. They're leading by the example. And so mimic them and ask them about it. But don't just ask what, like, what is that? Tell me about that. Ask why. Why do they love? The why is the emotional fuel and the why is going to be their motivation. And so that was the tip of the iceberg for me. And then I, I started buying into it. I was like, you know, you are right. And these, these things, I do like these things about myself and uh, whatever. And so the thing is that then I found, I found meditation and very soon after I found meditation, I found specifically the meditation that we did at that training, which is called meditation on twin hearts and not as this like plug for meditation on twin hearts or pranic healing. But what I mean is that meditation on twin hearts, it uses the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi and for the viewers, I don't know if you know St. Prayer of Francis of Assisi, but you should go Google it. It's the first half of it is what is used in the meditation. And it specifically goes through what they call the transmutation of negative tendencies into positive tendencies. And so that word transmutation is very, very important. It's not transformation. Transformation Im implies something could be bad into good or good into bad. It can go either way. Transmutation implies evolution. And so evolution implies improvement. And so it, it goes through and it's turning anger into love, uh, sadness into hope and all these different play. And so as you, the meditation sinks into you and you practice it, essentially, you know, there's a therapy modality called compassion training. And I think it originated out in California. It's from a Buddhist monk, interestingly. But the point of it is this, is that the meditation on twin hearts is like supercharged compassion training. And what compassion training is, is you take your heart, your love for yourself, you think of some stuff that you like about yourself, and then you extend it out to your circle a little bit, something that you care about to your family member. Then you extend out a little bit further, your friend, a little bit further to someone that you just met, someone that you don't even know. And you essentially begin to massage that muscle. And so it's like the spiritual muscle, this love muscle that you're actually beginning to strengthen. And so it's about practicing it, which has a lot to do with vulnerability uh, and action and repeating and, and being okay with vulnerability and realize that it's going to, the uncomfortableness is going to start, but eventually it'll, it'll dissipate and end. Um, one of, one of the therapists that we consult with at my job, she gave the example of it's like you're in the, in the ocean at your ankles and the wave comes in the wave of uncomfortableness because you're starting to be vulnerable on purpose. Uh, it waves up but it'll go back out into the ocean. It's going to be okay. Don't yeah. worry about it. Uh, you just got to make a decision. If that's your goal, your emotions don't get a vote. You know, your emotions, you're a multifaceted human being. Your emotions don't get to control everything, but because they're overwhelming and because we wind up swimming in them, they oftentimes think that they're louder than everything else. And they're not, they're just, they're one piece of the pie. We have to just put them in their place. They're important. We don't need to disrespect them, but we, they need to be in their place to allow us to do what we need to do to, again, to be that more whole person. Hmm. That was all so good. I like got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so 
yeah i mean just to recap everything you said was like you saw people that loved you like yeah. you saw your your wife and, and the love that she had for mm -hmm. you know you know, and for other people to see those who deeply love them, because we all have someone or something. And mm -hmm. if you don't like, you know, reach out to me and I'll send you some love, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or Nathan will too. He's really good at that. Yeah. Um, and then you allowed it, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's like, that's the huge shift is like allowing mm -hmm. ourselves to be loved and allowing yeah. ourselves to feel love. Mm -hmm. And giving ourselves that permission, no matter what we've done in our past or no matter who right. we've been, you know, I think through healing, like I've learned that I've generated a new heart for myself. Absolutely. And that's amazing. Like when, when, mm -hmm. you know, you're able to see that, like you have the power to do that, right? Like mm -hmm. we all have the power to generate a new heart that's built in unconditional love right. for ourselves and for the world around us. And so, right. Yeah. So seeing love in your life, allowing love meditation, especially that twin hearts, um, meditation is beautiful and amazing. Mm -hmm. And I would highly recommend if, um, I'll actually put it in the, in the description, just like a link to it, or if anybody wants yeah. to reach out to me or Nathan and ask more about that, please do. But that compassion training is something that is so, so helpful. So I'm mm -hmm. so happy that you, that you talked about that. Yeah. It becomes a reaction. You do that meditation, then there's not as much effort. Then you're not trying to like force and will this thing all the time. Like I have to do this. And it's this thing because my whole day was tough. And then I, it, it's a, it, it eases the process. A really good way to view it is that if you have your heart, it's like it stretches it and makes it big. And so you do this a couple times a week or every other day or every day, depending on how motivated you are. Um, and as you stretch it, you're strengthening it and it makes it easier to walk out in the world and have more natural loving reactions. And it's, it's, it's a no, it's a no brainer. I, I was very blessed, you know, and another, the huge last element to, to practicing that meditation and especially for, people that are either not experiencing love or, or males that may have a tendency to not experience or allow that experience is then once you allow it and you've gone through the inferno and you feel like you've burned in the fires of vulnerability, reflect on it. At the end of the day, reflect on it. Like pat yourself on the back, even again, layer it on. You know, like you went through the experience, you thought about it. That was the first layer. You experienced it the second layer. Reflecting on it is the third layer and even journaling about it the thing is is that whenever you know there's something amazing that happens and encodes into your nervous system whenever you're writing yeah. you know our culture is built around communication f beyond social media writing textbooks all these different that's how we learn it's it's bred into us and so you write as you write you're like changing your code your deep deep code and so at the left brain and the right brain we can go to the whole thing but at the end of the day journaling about it isn't just some happy fun-filled airy fairy therapeutic blah 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 thing it's like a legit research thing um interestingly a good chunk of research that i really like is when you write down your goals and you organize them through pen and paper i think the current research on average it makes them happen 40 percent more 40 percent more so that means that your encoding process journaling and experience like that consistently helps encode it 40% greater period. You know, it's super powerful. It's so powerful. And I highly recommend like all my clients to do that as I'm sure you do as well. I highly recommend, or I do that in my own life and it was, and I was resistant to it for a long mm -hmm. time as yeah. I need to do that. That's effort. I don't want to right. do that. <laughs> it takes time. I ain't got no time. Yeah. I got no time for that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's when everything for sure shifted for me is when I like just stopped the story in my head that I wasn't someone that journaled or like wrote things down. I just mm -hmm. was like, I'm not living from that story anymore. Like I'm not going to hold right. myself back from healing or from changing my thoughts anymore. And, you know, I'm, you mentioned like some, some, um, or just for me, like anxiety has been a huge thing for me. And mm -hmm. that's really helped my anxiety. I think in a couple of weeks ago, I talked about like my anxiety doesn't get to a 10 anymore. It doesn't even get to like a four. Right. 
it might get to like a two or a three depending on like the day <laughs> but that's yeah. amazing you know so i love that you mentioned that i think that's perfect cool great so first like transition question i'll say like are you what are you what's a challenge for you now and how are you flowing through it or how are you moving through it in a way that feels good to you yeah so a, a huge huge challenge and and truly like I take this challenge very, very seriously. It's such a, I love psychology. I love the way the mind works. And even the psychology of masses of groups of people is, is interesting. And so what I mean to say is that I truly feel so blessed, so lucky, so helped. And I've, I've come from here and I've gone and I'm, I just continue to challenge myself to be better and do better and, and more and help and, so my, the thing that really kind of plagues my mind in a really good way is that how truly really can I help people in a, in a bigger, better, and more complete and permanent way? And it doesn't have to be like, you know, I used to have an issue in the beginning when I was first doing therapy, like, why won't you follow through? And why won't you do your homework? Or why, you know, I wanted the results and I was kind of taking on part of their work. And I don't mean it like that. What I mean is that what I've found is that like um, my, my job that I have at the working with veterans, veterans don't pay for it. And so it's extra tricky to get a client that is not paying for something to get to create buy-in. And so I had to actually learn a lot about marketing, like business marketing. What, ha what draws people in? What makes them interested? How can you slide in something therapeutic and helpful while maintaining a captivated audience on an individual group in, in big platform? And so that I was so irritated by, I was like, I can't believe I'm reading a marketing book. I can't believe I'm reading my 15th marketing book. I can't believe I'm doing this marketing seminar. I, I, like it was, I just, finally I gave it up and I started enjoying it and it's cool. I love it. But what I mean is that it, it has a lot to do with, how to reach people and not like me matter to them, but help them matter to them and help them see their value consistently and in a massive, beautiful, awesome way that where they become more thrilled about feeling good and feeling better and believing that we have this goal, but we're not only going to get there. I promise we're not only going to get there, but we're going to stand on top of that goal and go for a different goal. And you're going to repeat that for the rest of your life. And it is going to be awesome. You know, working that type of message in, in different ways in different versions to different groups at different times and at the right time. So the right, you know, it is a super crazy thing that I think I'll be wrestling with for the rest of my life, which is cool. You know, it's a, it's an elusive dynamic, reasonable opponent that I, it really challenges me. And so it's really about uh, figuring it out because there's so many different ways. Like you shared uh, a theorem, a theory, a guy that um, teaches. I, I really like his mentality. I like his attitude. I like his message. I like a lot of things about him. Um, and it's just so cool that we have these opportunities to diversify and that the the pool is big enough for everybody. And that it's just, it's, it really truly is. And it's awesome. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have huge, huge needs. And it's about trying to find creative ways, creative solutions to reach them and get them interested and motivated and committed. And yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 So chat. Yeah. I mean, that's been a challenge for me as well. And that's when like, um, so Nathan and I are now have, I think of him as like a mentor and uh, with marketing and sales. And, and I think that's the, that's the thing is, is like finding people that you like that are, that are doing like that are doing it and they're in the work and they're able to explain it in a way that feels, um, you know, aligned with, with you. And 
I think I liked what you said about, or what I got from that was like continuing to take action. And even when you don't want to like reading, mm -hmm. you know, reading your 15th marketing book and yeah. as therapists, like in our schooling, they didn't talk about, Nope. They didn't talk about private practice in my school. I don't know about like your schooling, but nope. like they didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about if you wanted to go be an entrepreneur and, and like work with whoever you wanted to work with and, right. and really align with your clients. And like, I love all of my clients. I'm like, that's why I do what I do, but it, it's mm -hmm. just, deeper. Yeah. it can be deeper work. And therefore the marketing is a piece of that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I loved what you said about just reaching them in a way that they're able, like you're able to see their vision even before they're able to see it. And right. That's, Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, that's a gift. Yep. And mm -hmm. I think it's like an intuitive, it's an intuitive gift that we all have. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And the pool, the pool, like there's, there's, <laughs> you know, there's yeah. more than enough for everyone to go around. Absolutely. There is. Yeah. There's so much. More. And I used to not think about, I used to not think that. And that's, that was my mm -hmm. resistance to doing like an interview like this for such a long time. Cause I was like, well, then people aren't going to want to work with me, but that's just silly because like maybe right. they're not fit to work with me. Maybe they're fit right. to work with someone else. And yeah. that's like, that's their soul. But there's millions and billions of people who need me, who need you, who need right. whoever's watching right now. You know, like we all have different gifts and abilities and all of that. So, so. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's like that shift from scarcity to abundance. And so now I'm, super all about abundance and there's more than enough and, yeah. and it sounds like you're on that same frame too which is amazing yeah i knew it of course but <laughs> <laughs> okay so what's going really well for you like what are you celebrating yeah let's hear it yeah so it's it's so it's such a gift it is so fantastic um, I have, I have a young family. I have a three and a half year old and my, my son just turned nine months old and it is, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. Being a dad is so, you know, I, I thought that I had said my first dad joke minutes after my daughter was born, and my, but my wife politely corrected me and mentioned that she, she heard one or two of them slip out while she was in labor in the moments before somehow, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's fantastic. It's so much fun. You know, parenting, it's so, it's so challenging. It's, it's crazy challenging. It tests you in all kinds of ways. I thought, for example, I, I truly, I really believe this. I would have, I would have said it to you. Uh, I was like, I sleep deprivation is my jam. Like I was in the infantry. Like, I slept on in mountains. I, you know, what, what does that matter? You know, um, I've worked, I worked in factories. I worked shift work. I've, I've, I've been a cop, you know, all these different things. Um, but parenting is a different kind of sleep deprivation and, uh, and patience. I didn't realize that in the infantry, everybody's kind of not nice to each other and you're just rough. And there were weeks where I wouldn't shower when we were in, in Afghanistan. And so there was just different standards and I had just stripped those away and not paid attention to them. So, you know, I humbled, I was humbled. And I'm still humbled all the time, um, but it's really fantastic. It's uh, it's so much fun. Uh, the my my kids' laughs, their voices, their inquisitiveness, their curiosities, their their play, their imagination. You know, I gave a talk, you know, a month ago, and it was talking about some of the subconscious dispositions, especially as it relates to adults and how we become who we are. And one of the researchers I've been reading up on was talking about how kids' brain waves are in the alpha and theta state mostly, which is this meditative state. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine if you're constantly in this meditative state, like uh, uh, this notepad just is going to be so much fun. Uh, <laughs> and so it's just so cool to see their little minds work and to see their, their personality bloom and blossom. And it's not, it's not all you know, roses and sunshine, but even in the challenging times, you're seeing them work through it, right? Yeah. Um, it's just so cool. Like my daughter, she has, again, like my wife, just this huge heart. She is so kind. It is just, and so sweet. I just, it, it, it leaves, and that's another thing, especially, you know, um, 
grow in the heart, right? I just, the, my kids, like, it's just a natural thing. You just got to allow it. You can't fight it. Um, don't ignore it. Cultivate it. Focus on it. Be vulnerable. You know, one of my, some years ago, one of my clients one time, we were working on that particular stuff and they said, you know, a huge transition, their moment, I think, at least from my perspective was when they're like, you know, <laughs> I don't yell at my kids anymore to go to bed. I laid down with them and I listened to them and we talk and they fall asleep. That is that heart centered transition. That's leading with your heart and, and trusting your heart. You know, your heart is resilient. Your heart, Self-reliance has all to do with the heart. And so when we're, when we're not confident, when we're feeling less than, all these different things, it's, it's a heart problem. And so uh, it's about coming back into the heart to look at that self-reliance, to see that the heart puts the puzzle pieces back together. And that's its job. It, it sews and it mends, and it's going to be okay. It's your job to trust your heart and follow it. Yes. Yeah. It, it, go, it goes back to that, like, allowing ourselves to let our heart open and to right. let whatever comes in flow through it instead of feeling like it's going to get stuck. And usually it gets stuck, like, right here for people, and it, it won't, like, make its way way through. And then we're in our head right. and we're thinking everything. And so, yeah, definitely, like, dropping into the heart and um, cultivating that is, mm -hmm. is so important. So I love that you talked about that. Beautiful kiddos. I got one coming. So <laughs> yes. And open heart. So exciting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And naps. Take naps. Naps. <laughs> yes. All the naps. I love naps anyways. I take one like almost every day. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then any, so like any advice that you have for fellow like service driven leaders, professionals, they're on their yeah. journey, what, you know, anything, what you got? For sure. So, you know, professional driven healers or not, it's, it's action, 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 action. Um, you know, the, the, I forget where I heard it. I think I heard it. I don't think I came up with it. It's, um, you know, you could, a, a doctor could have the cure for cancer. What are they going to do with it? If they don't do anything with it, it nothing happens. You got to do action. You know, all the knowledge in the world is kind of rendered impotent if it's not doing anything, you know, I see, um, all these different trainings, you know, I have to go to trainings to maintain my licensure, but, and it's good. I like exposure and I like continuing education and all this stuff. But, um, you know, one of the things I practice is pranic healing and energetic healing modality. And so, um, it's good. It's systematic. It, you can take a baseline of someone's energy and then measure it against different physical health or mental health issues and begin to triangulate and target specific issues and areas and get at those and help people create change. It's not just about removing a negative tendency. You can actually backfill it with a, a positive opposite tendency. So, in, you know, the analogy I like to use is that if we have this internal mountain of a problem we have to climb, uh, that mountain can be turned at least more into a hill through the power of pranic healing. And so on that same topic, I see sometimes that people, you know, some people just like newness. They like the new iPhones. They like the new this. They like the new that. And you see them come through. You know, I've been doing prank healing for about five years ish. And they come and they go. And it's tough. I just, I really want healing and help for them. But at the end of the day, um, what's happening again, I think, is that they're not stopping, reflecting, and weighing did this add value or didn't it add value? And if it didn't add value, don't, don't do it, but be real with yourself. People don't stop and take a check of their pulse. How did that hit me? Or they learn something and they don't do action. They sit on it and they don't implement it. Right. And so uh, a big thing, even the pranic healing community, the, the leaders and instructors in the community, I've been hearing them say this a lot that essentially you know, we learn something new and that's great. It's like mental knowledge, but you can become mentally heavy or mentally weighed down. And so it breeds in action. And the problem is, is that if we take this, it's great to, you know, I, I like working with intelligent people, but sometimes they can be severely limited because it's just too much up here. It's like, mm -mm. I, I want, 
I want you pick one, one thing, you know, we had these great goals and they're prioritized. I'm done. Like you can have the, your money back or you can pick one thing and we're going to accomplish the, we're going to, we're going to hit that hard. And it's going to be awesome. I promise. Um, but they don't take something and actually implement it. When you implement it, you're actually kind of weaving that knowledge into your DNA. It's, it's, it's interacting with your nervous system. You're taking that information, you're going and you're practicing. And as you practice your, your five senses overlay, like all of your senses, as you experience it, it's this visceral thing. It gets encoded. You experience it. It literally becomes part of you. That's how thoughts, they produce emotions that produce words that eventually grow into actions that habituated, they form habits that grow into behaviors that become part of us. That's that process. That's the train is taking knowledge and working it and working it and working it and working it until it becomes part of us. It seeps into our cells and our DNA. And again, it, it begins and ends with action, action, reflection, and really being the judge. It comes back to that self-reliance, relying on yourself, your judgment, your capacity to discern, to be able to tell what's working and not working. That's why therapists, coaches, coaches are really great because they're, it's, you know, a person that is unbiased that kind of checks the pulse on all these different anomalies or different situations is a really great sounding board, but a, a trained one is even better because they help you galvanize into immediate action and take all these factors, line them up and, and begin to move forward. And they many times will help. I don't want to say force. They'll help bring about consistent reflection. What's working, what's not working and why. Um, in reflection and reflection and moving forward and another step in reflection. And then you get done with the, however long you're working with them. It's kind of like a whirlwind, but here you are with success and results and it's awesome. And you did it and whoever did it there, your client did it. And they want to say, thank you. It's like, you, you did it. You know, I, I just gave you the tools, you know, now you get to keep them and your conscience gets to be the, the coach, you know, you just got to listen to them. Stop, stop muting them, you know, mute the TV, maybe, maybe turn it off and, and do some more action. Yes. Yeah. So action, 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 reflection, integration. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm huge on integration. So I love that you brought that up and, and integrations, you know, for me, it's really about turning everything off and sticking to one thing, exactly what you said. And then, reading like reading notes that I that I took about something and like with the product mm -hmm. healing training for example like going back to my notes and reading them and practicing the healing patterns and looking at the different energy centers and and do, we were you know before we got on this call we were talking about practicing distant healing and, and what that felt like and and the power of of that because even in our training she the teacher mentioned you know like go home and practice once a week and put everything, you know, she didn't say this, but I think like put everything away because I get super mm -hmm. distracted. It's like squirrel, right? I think we're all kind of like, yeah. and so it's really integrating and, and setting time for that, like setting time for what's important to us and devoting that mm -hmm. time for ourselves and our healing and our journey. So that's really beautiful. Cool. Good. Well, Nathan, anything else you wanted to chat about or anything else that came up for you before we close up? That's all I have. I'm just, I'm very appreciative. You know, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to chat with you. I'm happy to see you again. You're fantastic and awesome. It was so much fun getting to know you and getting to chat with you a little bit before this. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, I am, I'm just super grateful to have you. And I think, you know, I think you're equally awesome and just such a wonderful human being. And so I'm honored that you took the time out of your day to be here and just to, to chat to my community. And then, you know, we'll, you can probably send this to your community or, or whatever. So yeah. how do people like reach out to you or get in touch with you if they want to talk to you more about anything that you mentioned? Yeah. So they can find me, um, social media, Instagram. It's my name. It's Nathan Ferguson or it's at Nathan Ferguson coaching. Uh, but it's the same for Gmail. It's Nathan Ferguson coaching at Gmail. Okay. And so that's, those are the best ways I, I keep up with those pretty frequently. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. And I'll put those, I'll put those in the description too, just so people have that. And Excellent. yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Nathan. It was wonderful having you. And thank you to everyone who um, has tuned in live or if you're watching later, you know, please feel free to leave questions and I'll make sure to get back to them. And if there's anything specific for Nathan, I can send them to send them to him. But mm -hmm. yeah, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and we'll talk soon. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. Bye guys. Okay.